Although many Game of Thrones viewers were surprised when Daenerys Targaryen wound up being the ultimate villain of the TV adaptation, and although many A Song of Ice and Fire readers still believe there is no way that she will be the final boss in the book series, it's actually not hugely surprising that Danny became an overt villain by the end of the story. Because although it's easy to miss, she pretty clearly chose villainy by the end of the first book in the series, A Game of Thrones. It's very hard not to have some level of empathy for Daenerys throughout the entirety of the first book. Because she suffers horrendously and it's obvious that she has been suffering for a great while before the audience ever meets her. However, the nature of reading through her point of view has a way of masking the darker realities of the choices that she makes from the jump. And it largely obscures the fact that from the moment Daenerys decided to be queen, she also decided that villainy was a worthy price for power. Despite the fact that she's only present for a few chapters, Miri Mazdur is one of the most influential characters in the entire saga. However, upon further examination of her short character arc, her influence doesn't likely come in the way that most readers or viewers believe that it does. Miri is among the Lazarene who are captured when Drogo's Kalasar is enslaving people in order to sell them and fund the quest to claim the Iron Throne for Danny and Rago. Miri is one of the many women that Danny believes that she has saved from being further repeatedly raped by the Dothraki by taking them as her personal slaves instead. When Danny realizes that Drogo has been hurt badly in the sack of the Lazarene, Miri offers to help by giving him a salve. And although the Dothraki are suspicious of her, Danny orders her to help. Miri does, and she gives Khal Drogo specific instructions on how to continue the treatment. You must say the prayers I give you and keep the lambskin in place for ten days and ten nights, she said. There will be fever and itching and a great scar when the healing is done. Drink neither wine nor milk of the poppy, she cautioned him. Pain you will have, but you must keep your body strong to fight the poison spirits. However, despite these specific instructions, Drogo adheres to none of it, and in many instances does exactly what Miri Mazdor told him not to do. Beneath his painted vest, a plaster of fig leaves and caked blue mud covered the wound on his breast. The herb women had made it for him. Miri Mazdor's poultice had itched and burned, and he had torn it off six days ago, cursing her for a magi. The mud plaster was more soothing, and the herb women made him poppy wine as well. By the time that Daenerys seeks out Miri Mazdor's assistance again, Miri essentially tells her that it's already too late to save Drogo. The time for that is past, my lady, Miri said. All I can do now is ease the dark road before him, so he might ride painless to the Nightlands. He will be gone by morning. Her words were a knife through Danny's breast. What had she ever done to make the gods so cruel? She had finally found a safe place, had finally tasted love and hope. She was finally going home. And now, to lose it all. No, she pleaded. Save him and I will free you. I swear it. You must know a way. Some magic. Some. Miri Mazdur sat back on her heels and studied Daenerys through eyes as black as night. There is a spell. Her voice was quiet, scarcely more than a whisper. But it is hard, lady. And dark. Some would say that death is cleaner. I learned the way in a shy and paid dear for the lesson. My teacher was a blood mage from the Shadowlands. Now... It's easy to miss one of the key elements of this exchange, but it really feels like a vital insight into Danny's perspective at this moment. Danny begs Miri to save Drogo and offers Miri her freedom if she does so successfully. To be clear, Miri Mazdor is a middle-aged woman who was free up until a few days ago, and unless she failed to mention it, she has never been a slave before. She was enslaved and brutally, repeatedly raped as a captive, specifically in service of Danny's quest for the Iron Throne. And that is a price that Danny was actively willing to let others pay for her benefit. As she sees the horror of the sacking around her, she literally thinks to herself, This is war. This is what it looks like. This is the price of the Iron Throne. So with that in mind, this agreement becomes far more disturbing. Miri Mazdor was a free woman who suffered horrendously while being forced into subjugation, and her master has agreed to free her if and only if she saves the man who led the destruction of her entire community. In order to get back what she already had, 
She has to serve the two people who were the entire driving force behind her slavery and suffering in the first place. Another one of their exchanges seems to offer even more insight into this unsettling dynamic. Mary says, It is not a matter of gold or horses. This is blood magic, lady. Only death may pay for life. Death. Danny wrapped her arms around herself protectively, rocked back and forth on her heels. My death? She told herself she would die for him, if she must. She was the blood of the dragon. She would not be afraid. Her brother Rhaegar had died for the woman he loved. No, Miri Mazdor promised. Not your death, Khaleesi. Danny trembled with relief. Do it. Now... There is arguably something admirable and brave about Danny's willingness to offer herself up as a sacrifice. But it's more than a little disturbing that once Miri says that Danny isn't the one who has to die, she simply says, do it. Firstly, that seems like the kind of scenario that requires some follow-up questions. But secondly, it seems to indicate that Danny is willing to use someone else as a sacrifice to save Drogo. This isn't a particularly shocking revelation given that the Dothraki have a larger than average appetite for slaughter. But it's also incredibly grim that Danny is willing to kill someone else, anyone else, in order to save her warlord husband. Things fall apart around Daenerys quite quickly after this. Once again, Miri Mazdor gives extremely specific directions about what should and should not be done. And once again, those directions are not followed. Miri says, once I begin to sing, no one must enter this tent. My song will wake powers old and dark. The dead will dance here this night. No living man must look on them. When Danny and Rago become distressed, Danny's reaction is desperate. No, she wept. No, please, stop it. It's too high. The price is too high. Once she goes into labor, things quickly devolve into chaos. And because she's delving into dark magic, no one wants to assist her. So Jorah brings her into the tent while Miri Mazdor is completing the ritual. After this, Danny is obviously in a dire state and is unconscious or barely conscious for an extremely long time. And interestingly, Miri is one of the slaves tending to Danny while she's recuperating. Once she's fully awake, she inquires about Rago. And what Miri describes is fascinating and seems incredibly important. Monstrous, twisted. I drew him forth myself. He was scaled like a lizard, blind, with the stub of a tail and small leather wings like the wings of a bat. When I touched him, the flesh sloughed off the bone, and inside he was full of grave worms and the stink of corruption. He had been dead for years. Darkness, Danny thought the terrible darkness sweeping up behind to devour her. If she looked back, she was lost. My son was alive and strong when Sir Jorah carried me into this tent, she said. I could feel him kicking, fighting to be born. That may be as it may be, answered Miri Mazdur. Yet the creature that came forth from your womb was as I said. Death was in that tent, Khaleesi. Danny's immediate reaction to this is also vitally insightful towards the decisions she makes in the immediate aftermath. Sir Jorah had killed her son, Danny knew. He had done what he did for love and loyalty, yet he had carried her into a place no living man should go and fed her baby to the darkness. He knew it too. The gray face, the hollow eyes, the limp. Daenerys is understandably gutted when she realizes that Drogo is essentially the living dead. And after accusing Miri Mazdor of tricking her, Miri comes as close as she ever does to outright admitting that she did this on purpose. Much of what she says and doesn't say here is incredibly interesting, but one particular line stands out. When the seas go dry and mountains blow in the wind like leaves, when your womb quickens again and you bear a living child, then he will return and not before. What is still very telling about this entire exchange is that while what Miri says seems to be quite pointedly brutal towards Danny and her childish, self-centered view of what has been done to her and her people, Miri never actually says that she has done any of this intentionally. She never actually admits to the crime that Danny seems to be accusing her of. And that is in addition to the fact that there is considerable evidence pointing to the possibility that none of this was Miri's actual intentions. However, 
The question of what Miri Mazdor did or did not do quickly becomes irrelevant. The story quickly hurtles towards arguably the most important moment of Danny's life, and Miri Mazdor is bound to the pyre and burned alive in the great fire that brings dragons back into the world. And because these twists and turns are so shocking, it's easy to lose track of what is actually happening here. Because while Danny makes a point of freeing all of the slaves that are left in her caravan before putting herself on the pyre, she does not ever free Miri. The evidence of Miri's crimes are pretty tenuous. So in the most positive reading of this scenario, Daenerys is burning her slave alive for rebelling against her master. And in the worst, Daenerys is burning her slave alive for something that she didn't even do. From that point of view, ultimately Miri's supposed guilt is somewhat irrelevant. I mean, in order to believe that Miri Mazdor is actually guilty of a crime and death is a worthy punishment for her, then one would have to accept that slaves do not have the right to act out against their masters. But ultimately, it seems far more likely that Miri didn't intentionally do any harm to Daenerys or Drogo at all. It's very easy to get caught up in Danny's POV trap in many ways, but one of the biggest traps is that because she sees herself as the world's main character, the reader or viewer immediately assumes that she must be right. But in her reality, the vast majority of people around her, especially in A Game of Thrones, see her as nothing more than the child bride of a warlord. Miri's position in the story is pretty clever, because ultimately, her guilt cannot be proven. Literally every rule that she gives in order for her assistance to work is broken. Drogo doesn't use her poultice in the way that it's intended, and Daenerys and Jorah enter the tent when she specifically told them not to. What Miri's true aims were is impossible to suss out, because we never get to see what would have happened if everything went according to her plan. And on that basis alone, it seems very unlikely that she was using her abilities as a Magi against Daenerys or Drogo. But if we are actually meant to assume that Miri suffered and labored in service of Daenerys in order to teach her this incredibly elaborate life lesson, the bigger question is, why? If this was all some grand plan to teach Danny a lesson, why would Miri actually care to do this? Why would she spend so much time and energy? Why would she do something that would ultimately get herself killed just to teach some random kid a life lesson that she doesn't actually learn anyway? It's another clever use of Danny's point of view trap. Because again, she sees herself as the main character, so someone doing this to her makes some sense to her. But Miri spends what seems like weeks enslaved by the Kalasar. She offers her assistance unprompted. She seemingly treats Daenerys after her miscarriage. She seemingly stays when she was afforded quite a few opportunities of escape. And we're supposed to believe that she does all of this just so she can have one good gotcha moment with Danny before Danny executes her in the most brutal way possible? It simply does not make any sense. However, even with that under consideration, if Miri Mazdur did whatever she could to undermine Daenerys and Drogo, if she went out of her way to do harm to them, she would still be in the right. Again, we're talking about a master-slave relationship. So to claim that Miri has no right to harm them or kill them would mean that a slave has no right to rebel against their master. But then, there's Rago. Rago is an interesting component of this entire scenario, because he is arguably the only truly innocent party who shouldn't have to pay for his parents' crimes. But there are actually a lot of really compelling subtleties about this situation that call Miri's culpability into question. Firstly and most importantly, once again, Miri is a slave. Interestingly, the story goes out of its way to repeatedly remind the reader of that because Drogo reprimands Danny for asking Miri to do something instead of commanding her as you would a slave. And Miri herself actually corrects Danny and says that you do not ask a slave, you tell them. So once again, this casts the following events into a different light. When Daenerys demands that Miri save Drogo, she doesn't inquire any further after Miri says that Danny's death is not the price. Perhaps an argument could be made that Miri was intentionally misleading her by not outright saying that Rago's life was the price for Drogo's. But still, Miri's guilt in this scenario is questionable, given that she is literally a slave following the orders of her master. 
but I think it's actually far more likely that Miri wasn't responsible for Rago's death at all. Danny obviously wouldn't be aware of it, but the fact that Targaryens have had similar stillborn children that are monstrous and twisted like Rago seems like it's very unlikely to be coincidental. It's not particularly shocking either. With a gene pool as shallow as the Targaryens, birthing children who have unsurvivable abnormalities is almost to be expected. So the likelihood that Rago was always going to be a stillbirth seems pretty high. But there's another interesting dimension to Rago as well. Because Miri does imply that Danny knew that the price of Drogo's life was Rago. And she says something that is absolutely fascinating in a broader context. When Danny asks when Drogo will be as he was, Miri says, When the seas go dry and mountains blow in the wind like leaves, when your womb quickens again and you bear a living child, then he will return and not before. Now, this is definitely veering into tinfoil hat territory, but the fact that Miri says, when your womb quickens again and you bear a living child, Drogo will return to you, could be incredibly telling, and actually seems to support the theory that Miri was being straight up with Danny and Drogo the entire time. Because yes, she didn't directly state that Rago was the price for Drogo, but Danny figures it out quite quickly when the ritual starts, and Miri says that Danny knew what the price was. Plus, it just makes sense. Sacrificing the child to save the father in a ritual based on blood magic seems like a pretty logical guess. However, Rago's deformity and Drogo's state could be connected. So if we assume that Miri Mazdor was actually telling the truth and was sincerely using her blood magic to save Drogo's life, then the fact that Rago was never going to survive no matter what and may have even been dead inside Danny in the first place, would have had an effect on how this magical life exchange worked. If Miri's blood magic ritual is intended to trade the life of one living human for another, then actually doing that ritual and unknowingly using a possibly already dead half-dragon baby would probably have severe consequences. And it would actually make sense that Drogo wound up as the non-functioning, nearly catatonic husk of a person that he became. And... Miri's statement about Drogo becoming as he was when Daenerys births a living child may not have been an insult, but a literal statement of fact, and a direct explanation of what went wrong in the ritual. Looking at the totality of circumstances, it actually seems fairly likely that Miri Mazdor was attempting to do exactly what she said she was doing, and factors outside of her control prevented them from being successful. Drogo doesn't use the medicine she gives him correctly, and he gets sicker. Daenerys doesn't keep other living people out of the tent, and the ritual fails. Drogo's child is the life that he's meant to draw from, but he's not really alive. And ultimately, it seems like Danny knows this. Or at the very least, she does not know for certain that anything that Miri did actually caused all of these bad things to happen to her. But regardless of that, what is essentially Daenerys' first act as a Targaryen queen is killing her slave in the most brutal fashion imaginable because she might have rebelled against her. But again, the broader question is, why? The exchanges between Miri and Danny are interesting because it's overtly implied that there is a certain knowledge between them that is unsaid. It's evident that Danny believes she has figured out how to bring dragons to life, and it seems like Miri has figured out that Danny has figured it out too. In order to understand the broader context of this entire situation, one of the most interesting keys to explaining the entire story likely lies in the tragedy at Summerhall. The incident at Summerhall is one of the most fascinating facets of the world of Ice and Fire, and despite the fact that it deserves in-depth analysis on its own, the amount of information that's actually known about the entire tragedy is shockingly sparse. Therefore, the fact that a great deal of the information available about the tragedy of Summerhall almost perfectly matches up with Daenerys resurrecting the dragons is even more meaningful. In both scenarios, there was a great fire that consumed a king and a prince, and both infernos were started with the direct intention of bringing dragons back into the world. But one specific, incredibly strange detail about Summerhall seems to demonstrate that the dragons would not have been resurrected without Miri Mazdor, and that the driving force behind Danny killing her may have been knowing her potential usefulness in the ritual, and nothing more or less than that. In A Dance with Dragons, Daenerys IV, 
There is a very interesting exchange between Danny and Sir Barristan, where Sir Barristan explains a bit of backstory about House Targaryen. I saw your father and your mother wed as well. Forgive me, but there was no fondness there, and the realm paid dearly for that, my queen. Why did they wed if they did not love each other? Your grandsire commanded it. A woods witch had told him that the prince was promised would be born of their line. A woods witch? Danny was astonished. She came to court with Jenny of Oldstones. A stunted thing, grotesque to look upon. A dwarf, most people said. Though dear to Lady Jenny, who always claimed that she was one of the children of the forest. What became of her? Summerhall. The word was fraught with doom. This conversation seems to imply that Barristan believes that the character better known as the Ghost of High Heart was actually killed at Summerhall, when we obviously know that's not true. This is a bizarre exchange that mostly comes out of nowhere, and it's odd that this particular detail is seemingly intentionally placed there. So why in the world would George R. R. Martin include this incredibly minor detail that the reader already knows is incorrect? It's a baffling choice that actually seems to make sense in the context of Miri Mazdur, and it is a really significant game changer for the entire lore of the series. If Barristan had been correct and the Woods Witch had died at Summerhall, then the tragedy of Summerhall would be a pretty direct one-for-one -one mirror of Daenerys, her ritual sacrifice, and her successful birth of dragons. The fact that he thinks that the ghost of Highheart actually died is bizarre but could hint to the fact that her death was intended by the royal family, and that her survival was essentially a mistake. This entire passage seems to imply that King Aegon V almost got the ritual right, and that Miri's death by fire may have been the linchpin that actually brought dragons back into the world. Then, when looked at in the greater context of Euron Greyjoy and his obsession with killing the holy magical leaders of every religion he can find, as well as killing his own unborn child in order to gain a great deal of magical power, it seems incredibly probable that this particular combination is a standard magical recipe, and that Danny and Miri both somehow knew this. Ergo, the supposed righteousness of Danny avenging Drogo and Rago by executing Miri Mazdor kind of goes out the window. It is possible that Danny has convinced herself that Miri truly is responsible for everything that has gone wrong but it actually seems quite probable that she is simply using that trumped-up excuse as a pretext to use her in a ritual sacrifice in order to gain more power. Clearly, the parallel with Euron should make it obvious enough that Danny has chosen villainy in this moment. And frankly, it's far from the first or last time that she has shown a willingness to let the innocent die in service of her own agenda. So then, what actually makes Miri Mazdor important? The first and most obvious horror in this situation is obviously that, even in the most generous reading of Danny's actions, she is killing her slave in the most violent, brutal way possible because that slave disobeyed her. There are many moments that call Daenerys' abolitionist beliefs into question, but the fact that so much of her slaver's bay conquest relies on slaves rebelling against their masters, while Danny believes she has the right to execute her own slave for supposedly rebelling against her, is arguably one of the most extreme examples of Danny's seeming adherence to the concept of rules for thee, but not for me. However, that's just the most generous interpretation, and one that seems to be pretty clearly incorrect. Danny doesn't seem to believe that Miri is culpable in any of these mishaps to begin with, and she only appears to come around to that idea when she doesn't get what she wanted from Miri and when she seems to realize that perhaps Miri's death would serve her better than Miri's life. And if that's the case, and Danny doesn't actually think Miri is behind Drogo and Rago's demise, then it shows a willingness for Danny to essentially invent supposedly justifiable reasons to slaughter someone for her own benefit. Which again, seems to be the first instance in a considerable line of instances where Danny creates a tenuous pretext of justice to get exactly what she wants or needs at the time. But even if Daenerys does sincerely believe that Miri Mazdur played her for a fool, she doesn't actually know. Nor does she investigate any further in order to actually figure it out. And this is the start of a terrifyingly long line of people that Daenerys very violently executes for committing crimes that she doesn't actually know that they've committed. 
for her, her suspicion alone is enough. And even when she is aware of or confronted with evidence that contradicts her belief, it's not something that seems to give her much pause or causes her to question whether or not immediately killing someone because you think they have done something to act against you is the right course of action. And although it's obviously not confirmed that Daenerys will burn King's Landing at the end of A Song of Ice and Fire, just as she did in Game of Thrones, the groundwork for that moment was laid as early as this one. While Game of Thrones deserves criticism for many things, establishing the foundation of Danny burning King's Landing is not one of them. There's a pretty direct narrative through line from burning Miri Mazdur alive for her own benefit based on some half-baked belief that Miri was acting against her, to killing everyone in King's Landing for not being appropriately deferential to Daenerys and not actively fighting for her to be their queen, regardless of whether or not she's even doing the right thing or doing something to help them. Ultimately, there are many moments before and after Miri Mazdor's death that indicated that Daenerys was willing to go down a villainous path as long as it gave her the power she believes is rightfully hers. But Miri Mazdor's presence in the narrative is one of the most widely misunderstood and overlooked elements of Daenerys' character arc. The birth of the dragons is typically interpreted as the true start of Dany's hero's journey. And the death of Miri Mazdor is often seen as righteous vengeance for a wronged victim. But that's only because this story is viewed from Danny's eyes. A more realistic version of this story is the fact that Miri Mazdor was someone who was horrifically victimized, enslaved, and then brutally slaughtered because her owner suspected that she may be rebellious and thought that killing her was more useful than keeping her alive was. In that light, it's very hard to see Daenerys as anything other than a villain. If it had been the only instance of Dany doing incredibly dark deeds in service of her ultimate quest, then perhaps she could have had some form of a redemption arc. But sadly, if Miri Mazdor truly did manipulate her in order to teach her a lesson, then Dany learned all of the wrong things from it anyway. No one can say for sure how A Song of Ice and Fire will end, but ultimately, Trading Miri's life for dragons was the moment that Danny actively decided to become the bad guy. But what do you think? Is Miri Mazdor's entire character arc widely misunderstood? Or was Danny right to kill her in service of what she believes is her destiny? Leave your comments and opinions below. And if you're interested in more content like this, like and subscribe.